are so many images of grace and gracefulness with which I can begin this sermon, but I thought I would begin with this one. Did anyone watch those videos back in August of gymnast Simone Biles winning her sixth consecutive United States Gymnastics National Championship. Did anyone watch those? And, and by the way, while she was doing it, performing not one, but two moves that had never previously been performed. As her dismount from the balance beam, she perfectly performed a double-double, two flips and two twists, a move that will henceforth be known as a bios because she was the first person ever to perform it in competition. And on her floor routine, she perfectly performed a triple-double, three twists and two flips, a move that will henceforth be known as the Biles Two, because this is the second move on the floor routine that she was the first ever in the world to perform. And these descriptions cannot even begin to do justice to the sheer awe of seeing a human being elevate so high into the air, spin and twist with such speed and force, and then land with such peace and stillness back on the earth. If you look up stories about Simone Biles' dominant performance at the U.S. National Championships in August or at the World Championships earlier this month, at which she won five of the six gold medals awarded, you'll find a word that appears in almost every article. That word is grace, or graceful. She is described as possessing, quote, raw power and graceful ability, as displaying, quote, pixie-like grace, as, quote, incredibly graceful, and on and on. In Houston, this past week, Biles threw out the first pitch in the second game of the World Series. But before the pitch, she stood on the pitcher's mound and dazzled the crowd by executing a single flip and twist from a standstill while wearing blue jeans. <laughs> Someone writing about this first pitch described her as, quote, gracefully defying gravity. And I am pretty sure, I'm pretty sure, almost certain that the journalist writing those words did not know that in doing so, he was invoking a different Simone. That would be Simone Weil, the French mystic philosopher and Antifa member. Simone Weil's best known work is entitled Gravity and Grace in which she uses the laws of gravity as a metaphor to describe the negative forces constraining the human soul, but argues that grace, grace is the only force that can triumph over illusions, idolatry, violence, and so on. In Vey's own words, all the natural movements of the soul are controlled by laws analogous to those of physical gravity, Grace is the only exception. Grace and Simone Biles. <laughs> but I'm getting ahead of myself here, and I want to stay in this world of athletics for a few moments. I don't talk about sports all the time, but when I do, I get on a roll. <laughs> we'll stay in the world of athletics and make a few observations about how we talk about grace. Because it's not just gymnasts like Simone Biles who are described as embodying grace. Figure skaters are often described as graceful. The swimming stroke, the form of the swimming stroke of Michael Phelps is described as graceful. In basketball, the form of a jump shot has been called graceful. And in baseball, because the World Series is going on right now, it's tied 2-2. In baseball, it is not uncommon for a batter's swing to be described as graceful. Grace is used in all these descriptions, but I want to argue that grace, as it's used here, is not just a synonym for excellence or elegance, 
not just a synonym for success or accomplishment or mastery. Grace is not just beauty either. Grace, when it is invoked, means something else. Why do I think this? For this reason. Because when an athlete falls off the balance beam or wipes out on the ice, they are never called graceless. And when a batter strikes out four times or a basketball player takes the final shot to try to win the game but sends up an air ball, nobody writes that they are a disgrace. Now there are athletes, as well as others, who are commonly referred to as disgraced or disgraceful, but it's never the ones who fall or flail or fumble or stumble. Athletes who are called disgraceful are always figures like Lance Armstrong, who won all those cycling races while doping, or Pete Rose, who received a lifetime ban for gambling on baseball games. So what understanding of grace is possible that can reconcile these two ways in which it is used? Grace is not about talent or success, or even character. Rather, grace has to do with a gift that we receive and what, in turn, we do with that gift. It has to do with the gift we receive and what, in turn, we do with that gift. Here is what is happening when we watch Simone Biles do things in gymnastics that have never been done before. When we watch her, we are aware of some inherent giftedness and potential. Further, we are aware that she has chosen to respond to these gifts by honoring them and by dedicating her life, her labors, her training, her entire being, heart and mind and soul, to their cultivation. Then, through her cultivation of these gifts, when we witness them, these gifts of grace are passed along to us in ways that awe us and inspire us. This grace is bestowed on us not in the sense that any of us receive gymnastical powers, but in the sense that that grace comes to us as amazement and reverence and love, and in a sense, through watching and perceiving that we become aware of a deeper connection between our soul and the universe. Does that sound a little far-fetched? I mean every word of it. In Christian theology, grace is also thought of as a gift given to us by God. This gift, according to Christian theology, is unmerited, meaning that we did not and cannot possibly do anything to earn it. And in Christian, traditional Christianity, the gift that is given to us is the gift of relationship with or connection with God, an unseverable connection with God, which in Christianity takes its ultimate form as salvation. Have I ever told you the story of the evangelical prison? Sudden transition. So years and years and years ago, I learned of an ultimate Frisbee tournament. <clears throat> it was happening a few blocks from where I lived. It was one where all the players would show up and they'd put everybody's name in a hat and they'd draw out teams and then you'd spend the whole day playing Frisbee. And I, at that point in my life, loved to play Frisbee. And so I went. I even wrote my sermon early that week so that I could go and spend the entire Saturday there and just take soak in every moment of throwing and catching Frisbees. So I show up. And I learn that the tournament is being run by an evangelical Christian group. And that to play, you had to sign up on their church mailing list. And so, and so I wrote my email address at the, at the time with some version of minister at unitarianuniversalistchurch.org. And I never got an email after that. <laughs> but for coming out to play... I and all of the other players were given a neon yellow frisbee with a Bible verse on it. I still have it to this day. And when I picked up the frisbee, I had to laugh because the quote 
that they used, the quote that they chose, Romans 3.23 and 24, was one of the most beloved quotes for our universalist ancestors. It was a, a universalist proof text. Romans 3.23 and 24 goes, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are now justified by God's grace as a gift. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are now justified by God's grace as a gift. And when the Universalists read this in their Bible, they underlined that word all. All are now justified by God's grace as a gift. All, double underlined. Now my theology and theirs is perhaps a little bit different on some things. But I find the idea of grace to be irresistible. Not so much in the sense that God gifts us with salvation, but grace in the sense that through our very existence, we are in receipt of gifts that we didn't do anything to earn, that we did not do anything to deserve. At the most basic level, these gifts include the gift of life and the gift of our inherent worth and dignity and the gift of our humanity. And on top of those basic, elemental, essential gifts, we might include all the other gifts that we receive, the beauty of flowers, the companionship of one another, the amazement of watching Simone Biles do a double-double from the balance beam. In many ways, <clears throat> my thinking on the gift of grace is shaped by an exquisite poem by Wisława Szymborska, the Polish poet and Nobel laureate in literature. Anybody ever read Szymborska? Szymborska's poetry is often filled with irony and contradiction, and this is certainly the case in this poem that I'm about to read. And to, to kind of understand this poem, the first 92% of it is written in the negative. She builds a case and builds a case and builds a case, and then in the last 8% of it, just undoes it all by introducing another. So here is Szymborska's poem, Nothing's a Gift. <clears throat> Nothing's a gift. It's all on loan. I'm drowning in debts up to my ears. I'll have to pay for myself with myself, give up my life for my life. Here's how it's arranged. The heart can be repossessed, the liver too, and each single finger and toe. Too late to tear up the terms, my debts will be repaid and I'll be fleeced, or more precisely, played. I move about the planet in a crush of other debtors, some are saddled with the burden of paying off their wings. Others must willy-nilly account for every leaf. Every tissue in us lies on the debit side. Not a tentacle or tendril is for keeps. The inventory, infinitely detailed, implies we'll be left not just empty-handed, but handless, too. I can't remember where, when, and why I let someone open this account in my name. We call the protest against this the soul. The soul. It's the only item not included on the list. Such a beautiful poem. The poem to be posits a world that is essentially transactional right down to our flesh and organs. That we're issued hearts and lungs and muscles and skin, but these are all on loan. They're property of God or of the cosmos or whatever. The collection agency, the repo man, can be called at any time. This is the foundation of imagining a world where nothing is a gift. Everything is earned or deserved or bought and sold. It is a world of ledgers and debts. There is no such thing as a free lunch. There is a gravity pull of exchange to everything. 
But then, just then, the poet imagines a force of resistance, a pull of protest, a soul which cannot be bought or sold and which resists and resists and resists at the sense that the world is like this. And it's the only item not included on the list. Carol Genovese, a member of our church, sent me an article about grace a few weeks ago in which the profound Christian thinker and writer Barbara Brown Taylor said something about grace that perfectly complements Szymborska's poem. Barbara Brown Taylor writes, Grace is alarming. Grace isn't fair. But since most of us want God's grace for ourselves and God's justice for everyone else, there's bound to come a time when we confront a third error of grace, which is there's nothing remotely transactional about it. Theologian Paul Tillich, in our opening words this morning, said that grace is this greater truth. You are accepted. You are accepted, accepted by that which is greater than you and the name of which you do not know. I began my sermon this morning by talking about graceful, grace-filled athletes who flip and spin and swim and shoot and swing. 99% of us here are not blessed with athletic grace. Be honest, preacher, 100% of us here this morning are not blessed with athletic grace. <laughs> but I also said that grace is not talent or success, but is a way of receiving the gifts that have been given to us and then honoring those gifts in our living. Honoring those gifts in our living. Grace was in the news this week, and I'm not talking about Simone Biles flipping on the mound before throwing out the first pitch. About 10 days ago now, U.S. Representative Elijah Cummings of Maryland passed away. And I was struck, I was struck that every single tribute to him that I read, every single tribute to his service and his life included the word grace. Quote, he represented grace, dignity, and empathy under the most trying circumstances. Quote, he carried himself with grace and dignity in all public forums. Quote, he defended the Constitution and acted with grace. Quote, he leaves behind a beautiful power and legacy. I am already feeling the impact of a little less grace in the world. I am already feeling the impact of a little less grace in the world with his loss. I could go on and on and on, tribute after tribute, dozens of them. Grace, 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 grace. But I'm going to leave it up to you here to reflect on what is being said about the nature of grace here. According to our Unitarian Universalist first principle, we are said, all of us, all of us, to have inherent worth and dignity. Inherent means we didn't earn it or merit it or deserve it. It is not on loan to us. It's not a part of some deal. It's just there. Now, there are a lot of misunderstandings about the first principle. I think inherent worth and dignity, I think of inherent worth and dignity as a gift of grace that we all have received. On one hand, we cannot lose our worth and dignity, but on the other hand, we can certainly act in all manner of ways that fail to honor, that squander that worth and dignity. We can act in ways that are unworthy, undignified, that dishonor, that disgrace. We can be graceless. I think we should think of our first principle not as a free pass or an excuse or a get-out-of-jail-free card. Dietrich Bonhoeffer called that cheap grace, which is responding to the idea that we are all freely justified by grace by concluding, well, that means I can do whatever I want. Rather, our first principle should be 
a challenge, should challenge us to ask ourselves if we are in fact living worthily of that great gift, whether we are honoring our own dignity as well as the dignity of others. There is a well-known story about the man who composed the lyrics to the hymn Amazing Grace. It was composed by John Newton, and John Newton was a slave trader from Britain. The story goes that out in the ocean, he was caught in a storm at sea, and that in the midst of the storm, as the wind and the surf and the waves and the thunder and lightning battered and tossed his boat. He heard crying out of the storm, or felt coming out of the storm, the gift of God's grace that he felt saved a wretch like him. And he responded to that gift, the story goes, by renouncing the slave trade and becoming an abolitionist and changing the trajectory of his life. There's actually some historical reason, don't mean to bum anybody up, but there's some historical reason to doubt that the story happened exactly like that. <laughs> Gotta tell the truth though. But the point remains. The point remains. And the words of Amazing Grace are still true. The universe has extended to us certain gifts which might be considered grace. As universalists who underline that word all, we believe that that gift of grace, that inherent worth and dignity is extended to all. And grace asks of us, how do we respond in our living? How do we respond in our living to that great and awesome gift? Let us respond to grace by doing our best to live worthily. Amen. Blessed be. And let us rise in body or in spirit and sing Amazing Grace.